surgery and to put a fun twist on it at the same time, I wanted to combine how bad flavors in beer. So we can learn a little bit upon what, how to balance outcomes in spine surgery to get the best outcome. And the same thing that can go wrong when we're brewing beer to kind of tow something together um, for bad outcomes. Can I, do I already have the slides? I don't see the marker. Okay. Um, there we go. Now, I guess fine. So when we balance spine surgery, especially let's talk about degenerative disease, you know, we're trying to balance all of these factors. And I always think I make decisions or talk to my students and fellows that I balance four things and they all start with P. We try to make decisions about, and make about patients' pain, their pathology and what specifically is wrong with them, their personality, which is always the X factor sometimes in a good outcome, and their overall protoplasm, how healthy they are and a variety of things. And we all know that most patients, the, the entire puzzle doesn't piece together perfectly like this. And those are sometimes it gives a bad outcome. Maybe we think it's a good outcome, but it may not have met all the patient's needs. Um, I can't quite advance this. Can you help me? I don't see the marker unless I'm doing something incorrect. I teach you okay. Eric. Yeah, I was trying to. There we go. One more. Okay. So how do you make an, a beer? Well, it requires ingredients, just like the pain, pathology, protoplasm, um, and personality of the patient. In beer, it's made of four key ingredients, barley, hops, water, and yeast. You take the, the barley, you mix it with the water, you bring it up to temperature, it releases fermentable sugars. Ultimately, we mix it with some hops for flavors. The yeast is a mechanism that creates that and helps us build a little bit of alcohol. So it's the same kind of thing. But really good beer is like having a really good place to do spine surgery. This is a brewery that I, I built in Wyoming and we built it with ceiling to floor tiles, just like an operating room so that no wild yeast can be in there. It's a very, doesn't have the contaminants. It's a very sterile, relatively sterile environment. And actually for every one day of brewing, we spend a day to a day and a half of cleaning before we can even consider going to do the next thing. And, and I think that is part of getting a good outcome when we brew beer. It has to be very similar to keep it in our environments like we have in the OR. But to make decisions, and I'll bounce back and forth between spine surgery and brewing beer, is we have to have the right personality. Sometimes our patients have a different vision of themselves. They come to us and says, oh, Dr. Jansen, haven't been able to run for five years. And I look at them and go, you're right, you haven't run for 20. And so all of our patients sometimes have to be honest when they look themselves in the mirror to get a good clinical outcome. So what gives a bad flavor when it comes to surgery? Well, we've all seen these kind of slides, bad flavors occur when we pick the wrong patient, the wrong phase of their disease, the wrong technology, the wrong surgery, try, surgeon trying something new. Or maybe we don't know exactly what's wrong with the patient, either because of all of these factors we see on a slide like this. In beer, most incredible, most single important thing is water. When somebody comes in and brew, gonna put a new brewery in your neighborhood, the most important thing, they have to have great water. If they don't have great water, they're gonna have a really difficult time producing great beer. I built another brewery in Mexico in Cozumel. Our biggest struggle is the water, as you would imagine. We have to chemically treat it to bring it down to the baseline where it'd be easy, so much easier if it was in an area you have really great water, which is your basic ingredients. You also have to have great barley. And the barley is what opens up and releases fermentable sugars when it's in the boiling kettle. You have to have great hops great flavors, great nutrition, not being stressed, and combine that with really good yeast. I find it very interesting that yeast was actually discovered in the 1600s. They didn't know it was live. It was ultimately discovered by Louis Pasteur in like 1860-ish. And from that, we can make great beer, do cooking, and do a variety of things. But I'll ask you, is it the, the monks made beer 2,000 years before they ever discovered yeast. So how does that work? Well, it takes fermentable sugars. It adds it to the yeast. And we basically say the yeast pushes out or pisses out alcohol and defecates out CO2. Those are the two ingredients that it does until it's done working, we can scoop up the yeast and actually reuse it again. So how about spine surgery? How do we get a home run? How do we hit the bullseye with these things? And I like to look at this kind of a chart. When I look at a patient, I think, what can I do to help this patient get the most amount of function? Because that's why they usually come to us. They can't do something they really want to do. So we're trying to lead, how can we identify to meet their functional needs? But we also got to balance out their financial needs. Some of them, it's about returning to work. 
Some of them, unfortunately, it's about a settlement. Some of it's a car accident. So we got this diagram of balancing out their function and people are pulling us away. Maybe their attorney, maybe it is their case manager, maybe it's their family because they're not being a good provider. And every one of these judge us on an outcome. The outcome for this patient may be different for the psychologist, the attorney, the family, the primary care, the, 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 the employer, the insurance company. They all look at us as a different measure of outcome. And, and whether that's return to work, whether that's disability, whether that's giving the patient restrictions, getting them a settlement, all of those have a big impact when we choose to take care of a patient and make a decision. It would be ideal if it was this, and we had this perfect circle balance between all of these factors to give the best outcome. But the reality is it doesn't happen. Just like in beer, all of these are bad things that can happen to the beer what, during the process and during the judgment of how you make beer and you get all of these terrible bad outcomes. And sometimes it's great for me. I like to walk into breweries and tell people what's wrong with their beer, just like I like to look at my own outcomes or ask my partner to tell me what I did wrong at surgery. But that's the same thing here. We've used this kind of an example. If this is a 45 year old person that came to your practice, that's got terrible low back pain, no leg pain. They're still working, they're self-employed. They've got a good social situation. They've tried everything. We probably think we have a good outcome for this patient. They got the ingredients to give us a good outcome based on this study. But if we have the exact same patient with same age, 10 year history of pain, back pain, leg pain, fired, dog's gone, wife's gone, girlfriend's pregnant, they're depressed, they're bankrupt, and you're their last hope, we might not be able to hit the same home run with that patient because of the other ingredients that go along to pick it. This isn't like trauma where they come in with a trimalleolar ankle fracture. It's really clear the best treatment, whether they got all these other psychosocial factors or not. But in degenerative disease, I think all these make a huge difference to get a good ingredient and a good outcome. With spine surgeons in industry, we work very close with industry. To give it, not to give an off flavor, we have to pick the right patient, clearly the right surgeon, and have the right technology that we partner with at the right phase of their disease. Because these patients, like myself, we're all getting older, we have different demands, we, we have different goals, and we have to help them accept sometimes what these lifestyle changes are, because patients want to be more active much longer. I live in Denver and a lot of these patients want to, they come to me, they want to ski when they're 75. They want to ski when they're still 80. And these are the most important things to them. Because if we look at this patient right here and we have to, we fail to identify what her real goals are and she's got some balance, we does some huge operation, we've changed her whole life. And we sometimes may not get the exact outcome that we want because the patient's outcome, even though we're treating the x-ray, may be completely different than ours. And it's always a challenge to manage these patients. You know, that have, you know, we look at their skin and we're trying to figure out where their outcome is or the active biker may be along the case. We see off flavors in spine surgery, clearly because sometimes we make the wrong diagnosis, we do the wrong operation, we get the wrong result, and we pick the wrong phase of their disease. I'm going to show you this patient, and I gave a talk a week ago, and someone was telling me, Mike, you got to be careful about putting patients' pictures. And I, I always get their permission if I can use their picture um, as non-identifier in these. So I did have their permission. This lady had a third time disc herniation. She's miserable with terrible, she's got a huge extruded fragment that migrated out the back, down to behind the body. She really did very active with activities, lives on the East Coast. So I choose to, to take the disc out and got it out from the front. You know, we always think that's always a little bit of a challenge. She, I put a non-fusion technology in this patient. I thought it was a great outcome because she had no pain. She went back to do her activities, except right there. She's a heavy boater, lives near the water. She, yes, she's 49, but why does she have a bad outcome? Because now she's angry. She has to wear one piece suit because she's angry at her incision. So she is really angry that this wasn't the outcome she wanted. She forgets about everything else. Managing outcomes sometimes in patients can be tough just like balancing good outcomes in beer. I want to share with you, there are eight terrible bad outcomes that occur called off flavors. Just learn them because you may have the taste to pick them up. The first one is acetaldehyde. It tastes like green apples. You get a little slight green apple taste because the brewing process went wrong because during the fermentation, the yeast actually converted to starches, which gave this off flavor. 
And sometimes it occurs because we got too much yeast. So now the yeast is competing with each other because there wasn't enough sugar. And so once it gets com competing with the, each other, it ferments really fast, creates temperatures, and you get this acetaldehyde, and it tastes like a little bit of green apple. Very common. Second one of the eight is buritic acid. Eh, people call it like baby vomit, but it's actually a bacterial infection or an off flavor um, in the beer. Um, you really won't get sick from this, but it gives, it's usually due to poor sanitation, poor cleaning. It occurs, I have tasted it in beers. Sometimes you may want it in a sour mashing, but in general, it's not acceptable in any beer to have this as an off flavor. I kind of think it's kind of what Miller Lite always tastes like. But anyway, this one here is called Dicetal. It gives you a little bit of buttered popcorn flavor in beer. Winemakers use this for Chardonnays to give it that flavor. It's an off flavor though in all beer styles to have a little bit of Dicetal, which is a buttered popcorn flavor. Why does this occur? Because the yeast can produces these diketones the brewery is too, the brew process is too short and it becomes a, a byproduct and sometimes a byproduct if the yeast is too stressed also to get a little bit of the diceal, which is Bob, uh, uh, now. Four, the fourth of the eight is called um, dimethyl sulfate or DMS. It's got a little bit of a flavor like a canned corn. It's very common in Pilsners. Some of the Pilsners, Coors Light, Bud Light, you'll kind of taste this a little bit because it's, it's, it's just the quality of that malt. Um, and what happens is during the German germination process, it breaks down to DMS and you can try to boil it off, um, but you gotta be very careful to be able to try to get it off or it leaves this kind of unfortunate off flavor. This one is called rotten eggs or a hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is normally produced in yeast during the, the lager formation, but most of the time the CO2 bubbles, that's when the yeast is sucking in the fermentable sugars, it's pushing out alcohol and pushing out CO2, the CO2 bubbles get rid of it and take it away if it's done at the right time. The only time, it also happens if you've got unhealthy yeast, the yeast is, we try to use the yeast over if you can keep it very sterile, but if the yeast isn't real healthy, it's been too hot, it's not kept in cool temperatures, it can be unhealthy. Some of the English ales where they got really hard water, it, you taste it all the time. This is called a, a, a mercarpin. It's kind of like a skunk beer, a little like rotten vegetables. Some beers all have it at low levels um, and it occurs because the end of fermentation gives you a bad outcome in the beer. Um, it's one of the main chemicals for bad breath. Um, and it's very common in beers like Corona because the sun goes right through that and you just get used to it and assume that's the way it should taste. And some of the uh, alpha acids in the sunlight together give you a light struck. That's why really, if you were gonna have a social event or something, don't serve it in a clear glass outside because you could, it can be light struck in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and now the beer tastes like crap and, and you get this skunk flavor to it. The seventh of the eight is metallic. That's really something's wrong with the brewery because it's next to old pipes. This is what happens when you buy an old brewery and you got terrible water and the beer and the water sits so close to this, you get this metal taste into it. Um, and it's really hard to treat it and get it out. And the last one is oxidation. So we want to make sure, and I was asked this earlier by Dr. Geyer upon beer lasting a while, it has to do with the partial pressures of uh, the uh, PPO2 of the oxygen when you can it and how long it's going to last to be able to kind of go through. And, and sometimes if it gets too warm, it'll do this and it gives what we call a cardboard flavor to it. It kind of tastes like a little bit of cardboard, but yet some people, they pick all the beers up. They're great at this. This is at the Great American Brew Festival and the largest brew festival in the United States. Um, and we always have a booth there and people love to come up and they'll be very critical of tasting things upon different ways to flavor beer. You can order one of these kits online, train yourself, just like you can train yourself in spine surgery to pick up all these bad flavors. You buy some beer at home with a party, you take some of this and you put it in each one of them, you go around the room and everybody that picks up, can you taste these off flavors? And it really helps you be able to pick up some of those. The last few slides I have to think about from a structural standpoint is bad outcomes. And we're all watching everything that's going on with the uh, industry and surgeons and partnerships and leaving bad tastes in our mouth about consulting agreements and the way they're handled and the Department of Justice looking after things we do and companies do and realize how important that is. And, and we're 
heavily scrutinized. And, and, and I think patients ask me all the time if I have conflicts of interest in certain technologies and things that we do, and we have a right and a duty to really be open and confront in the Sunshine Act to help them because we've been under a lot of scrutiny. And that can also give kickbacks if you have any legal trouble with a patient's outcome. And they always try to look at you know, our secondary gains involved in all this. And unfortunately, we've seen the same things happen with the CEOs of major industries. And this is in the paper that, that, that they've been coming down on them and, and actually had some substantial fines and, and prison time for people that bypass some of the FDA guidelines and things. So all of those can give us bad outcomes, picking the wrong patient, the wrong time, the wrong phase of the disease, and partnerships with the wrong phase of industry. And I, I view it very similar to brewing. Um, I have a master's in brewing. I went back to school about five, six years ago, built a brewery in Wyoming, as well as in Mexico. And we really don't have kids this young tasting our beer, but I thought it was cute because he wanted to tour the brewery. And, and you have to be as proud of your outcome of your product, whether you home brew or you go somewhere and learn how to taste good beer as you do as developing your entire career as a spine surgeon, because we can eliminate some of those bad outcomes and bad uh, little bit of off flavors. Any questions, guys, about that before we go into cases by my partner, Dr. Rumley? Great review, Mike. Let's do it. So uh, my beer question is, in traveling the world, how come the Belgians make the best beer? Uh, good question. I think A, they have probably some of the best hops and they have incredible grains and they really know how to deal with their water. And they've been doing it so long that it is just a phenomenal tasting beer. I mean, I agree with you. I think some of the Belgian beers are just outstanding. And some of those breweries have been in existence for, you know, hundreds of years and produce very consistent, very good wheat beer. Um, but we're, a lot of it has to do with their resources. I mean, we really struggle in Mexico to make great beer because we can't get the wheat and we can't get the grains and the barleys that are not great and they don't have the same freshness to it. So it's a real challenge. All right, thanks. Yeah. The good thing I want to make one more comment is, is beer. You know, we can brew beer to pair with all types of food. I give lectures upon beer pairing and desserts where I can manipulate and brew a beer to match certain key lime pies or whatever you want to do that. Where with wine, it, you, can't, you can't develop that wine to match with that. You hope that that wine out, comes out perfect to then match with certain things. Or if you're eating hot wings, for example, you know, get a good double IPA. And as your mouth continues to fill up with that hot sauce and hot wings, you just drink an IPA and it'll just keep cleansing it and you'll just be able to sit there all day. So you can pair those beers with different food groups just as easily as we've historically done with wines and really enjoy them um, just as well as going out on a cold day to have a beer. Great. You should try the, I encourage everybody, if you really like beer, try this off flavor. You can order it online, uh, try it and uh, have someone explain it to you um, and learn and get a group of people to go around and learn who can taste. Not everybody can pick up the, the popcorn and, the, and, the, and the, the apples and a variety of things. We don't all have the exact same taste buds, just like with wines, but it is something you can develop. And then you walk in and then it's very nice for you to go to a brewery and tell them what's wrong with their beer. I enjoy that. Sounds like a, neck, a great next task for the uh, next TBI Journal Club. Yeah. yeah, I'll even bring down the thing and bring the beer and we can do it together. It'd be fun. Oh, guest yeah. speaker for Journal Club. It's, it's a done deal. Oh, Mike, you're going to have to bring down a truck. Oh, I can find some bad beer. When we do, when we do off flavors, you want to just get like a, you want a very basic Pilsner so that when you drop it in, you can taste it and it's not overpowered with the IPA or the wheat. So I, I like an Amstel light or a Coors light is a perfect beer to drop all the different off flavors in. And then you can, everybody can pick up and taste that off flavor. Great. Let's go ahead and, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to have Jake Rumley as a partner. Um, he's got a, a, a lot of experience in managing, I would like to say, 
my complications, but um, just he's very thoughtful and he's got two really good provocative cases for us, I think, to discuss. Um, I'd only ask him to present the first one, then leave ample time to go to the second one um, so that we uh, can really open up some good discussion. Okay, Jake? Yep. All right. Well, uh, so I'm Jake Rumley, as uh, Darch Jansen said. I'm actually a home brewer. I've been doing it since I was in college because, uh, you know, before you're 21, you're not allowed to drink in Colorado. But if you uh, understand science, that uh, problem goes away. So I've been uh, brewing now for, uh, oh man, 21 years. Um, I view uh, as a home brewer, uh, a lot of my spine complications when I go to do rev revisions, a lot like when I was brewing beer early on. So um, with these cases, I just want to say uh, both of them I'm going to present, I was not the first surgeon. And uh, one thing I've learned by taking a lot of uh, revision surgery, both now and previously when I was uh, primarily a sports surgeon, is I always disclose the mistakes that were made or the problems from the first surgery early to the patient without any judgment of the prior surgeon. I just tell them what I see now, what we're going to do about it. Because in the end, all problems, especially off flavors and beer, hindsight is typically 2020. So typically you'll taste your beer and you say, oh my goodness, that tastes terrible. I, you know, put too much sugar in. I, I my temperatures were too high. I didn't uh, sterilize correctly. Very similar with, uh, you know, doing revision surgery. And lastly, no matter even if I think that it may have been, I will never willfully imply malfeasance against another surgeon. Uh, that is a great way to get sued. Um, and it's just flat out unethical. So I always say, uh, you know, those who live in glass houses, because we always have a, uh, uh, our own complications, we don't throw stones. Or if you live in a uh, grass house, don't throw spears. Because uh, as good as I uh, frequently think I am, I'm frequently humbled. And a lot of times I realize I'm not quite the rocket scientist I thought I was. So our first case, uh, I don't put, I don't get, uh, I don't get approval for my patients to put their pictures. So I just got bitter beer face guy down in the corner. But bitter beer face guy is actually a girl. So she was a 63 year old female who actually presented in uh, 2017 with neck pain, an entire left upper extremity pain. Uh, I, I do not have the MRI available, but the reports say that there was uh, uh, severe foraminal narrowing, C3 to seven on the left, worst at C5-6 and uh, six seven. She had no weakness on exam and she's recommended for a two level ACDF. So here's the imaging I do have from her. Um, I think we can all see that she has some uh, significant degeneration, uh, flattened uh, lordosis, but no congenital stenosis. Uh, she has uh, a little bit of a anterolysesis there at the base of her uh, cervical spine, grade one, uh, which we frequently see down in that area. But nothing on this is a, a really striking besides the fact that she just has significant uh, degeneration. So she was taken, uh, they performed a uh, C5-6, C6-7 anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Then the uh, patient returned six months later with continued neck pain. She was then offered facet injections and that gave her several days of relief. Uh, radiographs were obtained, which were reported to have no significant bone growth, delayed healing, and adjacent segment disease. On clinical exam, most importantly, she now had right biceps weakness. So this surgeon recommended a C3 to 5 ACDF removal of hardware and C3 to 7 posterior fixation. So this is uh, what she underwent, okay? She had uh, um, uh, extension of her fusion longer plate put on in these uh, facet uh, uh, devices. So I'd like to ask the panelists what they, what they think of this, uh, if they see any uh, uh, issues with this surgery and if uh, maybe what they would tell the patient after reviewing these uh, images. And they came to you for what now after all this? So I have not seen her yet. Uh, she comes to me right after this, um, but she came in to me after clinic as a follow-up uh, for uh, surgery. This was not Dr. Jansen's patient. Um, she had had previous surgery and came in. She's like, I don't think my last surgery worked. And uh, before I saw her, this is what I see. And she was reported to have a C3 to seven uh, fusion. So it's clearly so, interesting that the facet devices aren't at the same levels as the cages. So <laughs> there, there is there is an issue with some posterior instrumentation done at seven one that, and no posterior instrumentation at three four. But 
And, and so I don't know that the whole plan was good to begin with, but yeah. the execution wasn't perfect either. But I'm not saying that because we're not supposed to say that. <laughs> but but is anybody surprised that this patient still has neck pain? I mean, you, you described some biceps weakness. You didn't describe whether it was functionally disabling biceps weakness or just kind of a finding on the previous surgeon's exam may be used to justify a surgical intervention. I mean, it sounds I, I, like this patient has neck pain. I agree. And that's actually what was in there is biceps weakness. That's all it's written. No motor exam, no, uh, you know, uh, no identifiable, uh, true maybe indication besides reported biceps weakness. Uh, so I don't know if it was a three out of five, I don't know if it was four out of five, uh, or not, but yeah, I think, uh, I think there were a lot of things that uh, are maybe not ideal. We have some facet uh, devices, uh, not in the levels that were indicated. Um, we have a screw into the uh, disc space or at least very close. Um, and going into that level, which earlier we had noticed some um, uh, spondylolisthesis. So, uh, Just to go back to that, yeah. there, there's also absolutely no regard for cervical alignment Agreed. there that she, she could lay down flat and you can use her neck for a coffee table. That's how straight that is. And, yep. and Jacob, the other thing, you were very kind. The upper screw is barely into the vertebral body. 100% agree. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, so it's hard, to, it's hard to imagine why this didn't work. Bad indications, bad execution, and <laughs> uh, poor restoration of alignment. I, I just don't understand why it didn't work. Yeah, that, that's, that's why I would say this is the incorrect recipe. We, we have bad water. We have bad yeast, we have bad barley or malt, um, yeah, and apparently old hops. So from the beginning, I would say that, you know, this is really a patient who presented with neck pain and a neck pain with bad facet uh, disease and flattening or cervical lordosis and uh, was offered a two-level anterior cervical discectomy infusion. So um, now we're at this point where now we, we have a question about were the correct levels instrumented? Um, and according to the op note, they were not. So, uh, she came in two weeks post-op after this, uh, and she noticed numbness and tingling in her right hand, especially her small finger. Uh, she felt that her strength in her, uh, sorry, it should say right biceps was improved. Um, at the three and six month post-ops, I've still yet to see her. She has neck pain improving, but persistent radicular symptoms in her right, uh, ring and small finger. And a uh, nerve conduction study was ordered because they felt that it may be related to some cubital tunnel position or uh, syndrome, maybe from uh, uh, positioning or, or whatnot. Uh, that EMG showed C8 versus T1 right radiculitis and radiculopathy. Um, and uh, they noted some improvement in her prior C6, C7 radiculopathy, uh, but we didn't have that prior EMG. Um, so she actually underwent a uh, transfemoral injection at C7 and T1, and she got 65% short-term improvement in her pain uh, and her symptoms into her small finger. It, her 12-month post-op is the first time I've seen her. So on my exam, I noticed she had uh, 3 out of 5 uh, T1 on the left, 4 out of 5 T1 on the right, so finger abduction. Uh, sensation was decreased to both C8 and T1. And she was uh, now on her fourth injection in that area. And the last one had given her uh, three days of improvement in radicular symptoms down into that side of her hand. She also had mild wasting of her intrinsic musculature. And like I said, we have a, a nerve conduction study that shows that this is not a uh, ulnar neuropathy uh, causing that. So at this point, I'm kind of wondering, what do I do? I have a patient who I'm worried about the wrong site uh, or wrong site surgery, essentially, potentially wrong indications. Um, so, you know, I, I started by getting imaging, trying to get the rest of the information I can. Um, I noted she had an incomplete anterior fusion at the upper instrumented or at the upper, uh, instrument level anteriorly with no devices posteriorly. It appeared that she had, uh, osseous fusion, uh, certainly at the, uh, bottom levels. And I was actually a little concerned also at, uh, C4-5 about that uh, being fused. We obtained, uh, then looking out at the facets, uh, we see that she actually has pretty good facet effusions around these inner facet devices. Um, but that bottom uh, uh, facet fusion device is actually, you know, it's in the wrong level, which we've discussed, and it's narrowing the foramen. 
Um, the patient had a contraindication. I can't remember what it was to MRI, but I also questioned how, how good of imaging I would have gotten an, of an MRI uh, with these devices in because they are uh, metal. So I, I also was not heartbroken by that. Jacob, why didn't you get that with dye? Why didn't you get a Milo CT if you were looking for a ridiculous compression? Uh, I, I did. I just did not include oh. those on, on this. I, the, the Milogram, there was a little bit of motion artifact. It just didn't look great. Uh, and it, you know, so I was uh, taking a little bit of hope that you guys would say, yes, uh, there, there's a little bit of narrowing. And her um, complaint is more the radiculopathy or the neck pain no, or both? No, it is all hand symptoms. It's all really CAT1 symptoms. Uh, so, she's wasting weakness, but every time she gets the injections, her strength improves a little bit. Um, but zero myelopathy, um, really just uh, a radiculopathy. So I guess my question would be to you or any of the panel, do you go specific for symptoms, which is the radiculopathy C7T1, or do you, you know, go for the, the non-unions and the, the sagittal balance and all that stuff and try to do the whole, the whole thing? That's a good question. Um, I guess the other thing I'd like to add, uh, let's have the panel tell me, who finds usage for this particular type of technology in, in the back. And do you think it becomes somewhat hypogenic or does it really a minimally invasive way to stabilize the facets too? I, I don't use it. So I'm open-minded enough to hear those that are- uh, Mike, Mike Heisey has some experience. Mike, you want to speak to that? Primarily for pseudoarthrosis. So they've already got something in the front. And it actually works very well in terms of stabilizing. Obviously, you've got to position it right, not put it in too far into the foramen. But I, I have a very high rate of healing with these, and it's super minimally invasive. So uh, it's, it's very good for the right patient. I don't use it as a standalone. Uh, I have, they're doing a study where they're looking at it as an augmentation to multi-level effusions in high-risk patients. I don't know what the results are like on that. But... Uh, this is a weird indication and, and getting it. Well, I would also say it's the right, it's the right implant in the right person's hand. Somebody who's experienced with posterior cervical surgery, uh, because this patient actually had two large incisions that were just as long as a long posterior, uh, uh, incision. So her skin, certainly this would be, this was not a minimally invasive surgery for her. So that um, was her only posterior operation was this and she has huge incisions. Yes. Yeah, they, they essentially That's get them. Crazy, open. Yeah. Yeah, because this is usually done through one incision the size of a pencil, and you can get all four levels. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, and I, I think that uh, the problem with this patient is now I'm talking to a patient, uh, and I would like to know your guys' opinion where I, I'm wondering okay, she has a non union above the sagittal balance, but also she doesn't trust spine surgeons at this point because she's had multiple failed surgeries at every step. And I'm walking in, uh, you know, saying, hey, I, I, I don't know if I can fix you. Um, and one thing as I wanted to ask the panel is, do you have any uh, thoughts about transforaminal injections in the cervical spine, giving patients intermittent pain? Does that lead you to counsel the patient that they're more likely to have improvement with decompression? Or do you think when you have a physical trauma to a nerve root from a, uh, a surgical implant, do you think that that... Um, what, what do you tell that patient as far as their likelihood of getting better if you're planning on removing that? <clears throat> I mean, this is Jens. I mean, this is a great case, and I'm uh, uh, congratulatory of both of you and your team of showing this. Uh, I love the, the beer presentation, and this is a great uh, metaphor. So, I mean, we see these patients all the time, and again, this goes into uh, all aspects of relationship building towards rebuilding trust. Um, and the workup for these is pretty simple. It's uh, standing uh, full length AP laterals with an EOS or with a scoliosis system. So you understand the alignment flexion extension films. If need be a CT myelogram, um, inflammatory parameters, and then obviously uh, EMG of any extremity involved. I would at this point in time, not so much rely on further injections. Uh, there was a great lecture by the Indianapolis group in this session a couple of weeks ago 
on not using steroids if you want to go for selective nerve root blocks and just using lidocaine. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the, the revision for this uh, to me is pretty simple. Once a patient's been worked up, uh, this is a posterior multi-level, basically C2 to T2 revision decompression fusion with removal of the offending hardware. Uh, under restoration of best possible alignment, and that's usually best done through C7T1 by doing like an extension osteotomy. And this can be done all posteriorly with Dan Rue's statement. Obviously, swallowing studies might have to be added to it. But this is, again, uh, a abuse of too much metal. This is uh, the era of metallusion where we don't really know whether we have a fusion or an illusion in front of us. And um, again, I totally agree with you that the trust in spine surgeons where there's just this charlatanery taking place with bad ingredients, bad concepts, is, uh, and a hell of a lot of naivete uh, is really pervasive. Thanks. Yeah, so this is, obviously this is very atrogenic, Jens, but is there any circumstance under which you, if the, if the primary complaint was the C7T1 radiculopathy, where you would just go, site specific and do something just at C7T1 or is that doomed to failure? Ultimately, we have to uh, serve our patients. And again, I'd have to have a bigger gestalt of where, what non-union is, how she does on flexion extension films. Um, I would not push hard, but uh, if I felt comfortable that the non-unions were a problem, I might consider just a posterior phrenotomy, hardware removal and segmental instrumentation. But I'd be very clear that I personally think from what the bits uh, are that I've seen, a C2 to T2 fusion would be the more predictable uh, salvage in this situation. That's the key word here. Thanks. And you'd, you'd have to have a lot of trust in this patient because after she went through all this and now she's not any better. You know, I do like Scott's idea of just doing one step at a time. You can always come back and, you know, do more later. But again, as you said, you have to see the patient in front of you and get an idea of what they want. I don't think there's any urgency to revising, you know, her upper cervical spine. I mean, for me, this is a, a situation of, uh, and I, I see the wisdom in what you said, a hundred percent of a chair. This is where you need a chair and you need to sit down and you need to tell your office manager, I'm going to be a little bit late for the next patient. And I'm just going to sit and listen. And, um, I'm gonna tell the patient, we're not making any decisions right now. We're gonna complete our assessment. We're gonna see you back. We're gonna, uh, the range of options, we're not even gonna go there right now. We're just gonna have a complete picture and uh, getting to know the patient in this setting is hugely important. So what Scott said, uh, I think it was Scott who said that is so critical and just kind of stopping the uh, inevitable time progression of 10 minute intervals in our clinics towards, okay, we're just gonna sit down and look at where you've been and what I see and then go from there. These are your options, this is your game. Yeah, Jens, I think that's very Marcus Welby-esque and you know, you're showing your, uh, your age from the old days of medicine, but unfortunately um, it looks like the new age is not gonna allow us to do that uh, the same way we used to. And it's, a, it's kind of a shame because people like this uh, do need a little bit more time uh, then somebody comes in with, uh, you know, lateral epicondylitis. <laughs> so, so I can say that this patient spent uh, approximately an hour with me at every appointment, going over her images, talking about this at length, and uh, telling her that there is an absolute chance that with anything we do, it could be a problem. So this was the MRI uh, that, that we had. Um, she didn't have a contraindication. I forgot. This is what we got. All that metal, you couldn't really see anything at all. So uh, I learned from that uh, in hindsight, I'm not going to get an MRI if they have facet devices, if I'm looking for facet or uh, foraminal compression. So uh, findings as uh, stated above, after a long discussion with the patient, um, I also did get upright scully films. Uh, she was uh, she slightly forward, not, not horrible. Uh, I thought I could certainly address this all from the back. Um, she had no swallowing problems, as I heard uh, uh, Dr. Chapman mention. She, she was not complaining of any of that. Uh, and really telling her, like, our primary goal is to make it so hopefully she's not going to have to have another surgery. So I discussed with her, let's take out the hardware on both sides. Let's do wide uh, foraminotomies and actually facetectomies, try to correct some of her sagittal uh, malalignment. And uh, my plan is to uh, go up to C3. That way I could uh, stabilize that area that looked like she had a non-union. C2, um, as we go back, looks perfect. There's no degeneration. I felt if I fixed her sagittal alignment uh, that I, I did not feel like that was a high risk of uh, breaking down in anytime soon. 
But you can also see on that MRI, she has a little bit of lysthesis there at that uh, bottom level still. And there's a, a more degeneration of that disc level. So uh, we successfully uh, performed this. I'll show you the x-rays in just one second. I accidentally put those out of order. Uh, Post-operatively, the patient actually had increased pain in CAT1 distribution after that uh, uh, um, C7T1 uh, foraminotomy and hardware removal, but that did resolve over a few weeks and she had increasing sensation and motor function. So this is what we did. Um, I placed screws up into uh, C3 down. I removed that uh, facet device uh, from uh, C7T1. And I'll say that the, the implant was actually through the center of the nerve root. The nerve root was split around it, which you didn't see on the myelogram or the MRI. Uh, it was pretty impressive. So when she woke up, I sat down and talked to her for about an hour telling her how it probably wasn't going to get better. Not realizing the whole time that she was abducting her fingers in front of me, telling me how great they felt and how much stronger uh, her hands were. <laughs> So uh, that, that was uh, me learning that I actually need to look at the patient and stop feeling uh, bad about myself. Um, so cervical roots, just, this is beautiful. Um, and again, we don't have to argue about C2 or not. I think C2 is a better fixation and there's not much motion loss between C2 and 3. So it's a higher predictability, but I, I have no, no fault with a nice construct like this, what you've done. The point about cervical roots that I always find fascinating is they have an anterior posterior division. Roughly a third of the cervical roots have an anterior posterior division. This may have been a case of one of those divisions that have been splayed apart. So just saying, uh, don't give up. And yeah, great, great case in point. Yeah, I, I was shocked at how uh, erythematous it became when I took that implant out. And you know, I don't want everybody to think that I'm saying negatively about these interfacet devices. I will say that was one of the hardest implants I've ever taken out in my life. Uh, they absolutely were formed a ton of bone around them. Um, but this is her uh, follow up. I think this was at uh, uh, six months post op, if I had to guess. Um, and she did well. She got a uh, hand function back. She's four plus out of five. She's not five out of five. Her radiculopathy completely resolved. And interestingly, her neck pain resolved. When I talked to her about her neck pain after uh, surgery, because I was really focused on her radiculopathy and told her neck pain does not improve with posterior cervical surgery, uh, she was having uh, cervicogenic headaches. Um, and I think the restoration of alignment actually helped that a fair amount. Um, and so I, uh, she was very happy with that. And I'll say, you know, uh, what I really learned from this is you have to have the right plan going in, because if you have the wrong plan going in, no matter what you do, it's not going to come out right. Then you're going to be chasing your tail the whole time. So uh, that, that's the first case. Any, any feedback on this? Uh, any other uh, thing people would like great, to Great result. Just out of curiosity, what, what biologic did you use? So uh, I, I use a, a cortical fiber. Um, it's, uh, called, uh, osteostrand plus, uh, but I, I use cortical fibers. Part of that is limited to what I have, uh, accessible through the hospital system I work with, what's on contract. Mm -hmm. any trouble it's very nice. Nice salvage. Did she have any trouble swallowing afterwards? Zero. Zero. Mm -hmm. So, uh. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I was surprised after two uh, big anterior cervicals and a correction of her lordosis. She didn't develop any dysphagia, but she did not. She did. She did excellently. Great. Well, let's go. To, since we have time, let, you have another case. Is that yep. right? In, in yeah. 15 minutes. We'll, yeah. So, next yeah, so uh, <laughs> next one. Uh, remember, we're not in the arthroplasty section. So uh, um, when I present an arthroplasty that didn't go well. Um, uh, I'm not saying arthroplasty is bad. So this for this one, uh, this is a 37 year old female who presented. She was uh, nine months out from a C3, 4, 4, 5 cervical disc arthroplasty for radiculopathy, which was diagnosed uh, by EMG. Uh, Postoperatively, after her surgery, uh, she came to me complaining of uh, worsening balance and hand function. And especially when she would text on her phone, her hands would go numb. Then when she tried to stand up, she'd almost fall down. So these are the, uh, implants they put in. Um, I would, uh, this is straight the AP, uh, and lateral. Then we have flexion extension views. I'd love to hear from, uh, the panelists, what their thoughts are on this patient. Um, it's certainly one She's of She's got the, some hypermobility. At yeah, this some hypermobility level. at the upper level. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, overall, I mean, 
you, you could make the case for she had neck pain related to the four five, but I mean, it's not, it's not atypical for this particular prosthesis. And, and she also looks like she's a little sub subluxing just a little bit at the four five level as well. Mm -hmm. Sort of retrolisthesis with extension and goes forward a little bit with flexion. Yeah, I, when I look at these, um, I always think that, you know, each prosthesis, when we stack them, whether it's semi-constrained or totally constrained or whatever, however you want to classify them. When I look at the right picture in extension, clearly the lower implants in extension, the upper implants are neutral. And when you look at the flexion film, the lower implants almost neutral and the upper one does the flexion. So in this case, each one's moving a little bit differently for the mechanics of flexion and extension. And I think we see very typical when we stack two uh, non-fusion technologies on top of each other. And do you guys worry at all, and especially in a young female, high cervical? Uh, I wouldn't say she has exceptionally uh, flat facets, but using an unconstrained device at these levels. So we talked about that a lot uh, over the last week or so, particularly at the arthroplasty meeting yep. we just had. And there's definitely concern amongst young female patients with a less constrained prosthesis that particularly thin neck, and I don't, doesn't look like she's got a thin neck because I see some folds there, but still, I mean, in a certain age range, um, females seem to do not as well with the less constrained prostheses. Well, the, the other thing, Jacob, I think that we have to be more careful about assessing the preoperative x-rays. Mm -hmm has an unpublished paper where he talks about hypermobility. And, you know, he says that hypermobility is more than 17 degrees of motion. And if you look here, we don't know what her pre-op was, but clearly she has more than 17 degrees of motion at the C3. Who, whose paper was that? It, it's, it's unpublished, Pat Warden. Oh, okay. All right. Well, it makes but, sense. And, I mean, I, I think clinically we kind of have the same gestalt without the, without the number. Yeah. So, I mean, he put some numbers to it, but clearly he almost looked like she has 20 degrees range of motion there. And look she's, at yeah. she's very generalized. She got generalized laxity because it, it, all of her interspinous spaces open up a lot. And if you look at her facets, you know, some of these people, they su almost they're, they're almost subluxing or perching their facets. She's not. So her facet capsules are doing better for her than, um, than many. Um, and it's really more in the interspinous space. So she's probably just a, um, you know, a lax ligamentous uh, type person, but yeah, and wouldn't you? But but wouldn't you expect a more? It. Wouldn't you expect a more mechanical kind of neck pain is, issue than a neurologic? Well, she's had this. She's been ligamentously lax all her life, probably. I'm just the point I would. But just if make she was symptomatic, I guess I'm asking if she was symptomatic. I, I don't know that that the hypermobility would explain neurologic symptoms, but certainly could explain oh. Oh, axial oh, oh, symptoms. God. You know. I can't measure it out on my screen here, but her torque ratio looks sort of borderline. I mean, her yeah. honest process is very, very close to her facets. Yeah, exactly. maybe so. Exactly. Yeah, she is. She's congenitally stenotic, and she's ligamentously lax. And as you see, when she goes into flexion, I don't know what her pre was. Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not claiming that the previous surgeon did anything wrong, but I worry about. You know, she's essentially developed or demonstrating almost like a lair meets when she leans forward hands go numb looks down at her phone and she actually demonstrated i had her do a tandem gait in clinic she could do it then she sat there and looked with her chin on her chest for about 20 seconds and could uh -huh. barely get out of the chair so it was almost causing like a central cord in her uh just from Jeez. sitting and looking at her chest you'd be an interesting person to do a flexion and extension mri on you know and see what what her cord is doing Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is uh, this is a CT myelogram. I included the contrast for you at this time. Uh, so uh, this shows her implants. And as you can see, she doesn't have a lot of extra space available for the cords and certainly uh, uh, mild cervical flattening. But this is C2. This is her asymptomatic, asymptomatic level. Then we get to C3-4. Um, and it's not the implant that appears to be causing the compression, at least uh, in my opinion. It just looks to be almost her anatomy. So they're uh, going out her foramen on the left side is a little tighter down to the next level, worsened in that foramen that the cuts are a little off, a little oblique, but not, not horrible. It certainly has a fair amount of uh, uh, flattening or uh, deformation of the cord. 
And the one thing I would say is on this CT compared to her uprights, when she's, when we're looking at this CT right now, we're looking at a CT with her essentially in what she is in her upright, but we do not see what is happening dynamically to the cord uh, and to her when she's looking down at her phone, which I think is an increasing problem with modern society because nobody can go more than 10 minutes without checking their Facebook status and to see if something sold on Facebook marketplace. So everybody's <laughs> sitting down. Yeah. So you're, you, so you're making the case that this should be salvaged with more of a stability procedure than maybe a more stable arthroplasty. So I think, uh, I think that a stable arthroplasty is an option and I don't think it's a wrong option. Um, I think in my hands, uh, you know, this is also a patient who once again, nine months after surgery, you're talking to her with uh, these neurologic symptoms. And I told her, well, let's keep an eye on you. I'm worried we're gonna watch you very closely. Uh, I discussed with her myelopathy you know, she was not excited about the idea of getting a fusion after she just had a two-level arthroplasty. She's 37 years old. I'm not excited to fuse this, this uh, individual. The problem is she came in two months later and advanced to a NERC 4. So she was now cane-bound at all times. Uh, we repeated her imaging without changes. I actually sent her uh, over to my partner for a psych evaluation to make sure that this wasn't like some kind of conversion disorder. But again, if she'd looked down for any amount of time, she would develop hand and leg parasitages. So what, what would everybody do now? Yes. <clears throat> I mean, this is a really compelling case. And again, these congenital stenosis patients are so uh, thankless to take care of. Do you mind showing me the extension one more time? I saw the flexion in the neutral. Do you have an extension handy? Yes, sir. Oh yeah. I mean, honestly for me, um, first of all, I showed in our arthroplasty meeting a almost similar case, almost worse. And Dr. Ziegler was very kind. Dr. Blumenthal were very kind to me because it had subluxed actually worse. You remember that Jack and Scott? And it's just like, oh man. Yeah. Um, I, I've yeah. been there with this device and I just don't like it anymore because it's uh, inherently unstable. Um, uh, as a food for thought in a young patient like this, I think that this might be a very good laminoplasty case. I know that uh, both Jack and Scott were predicting that I would say that, but uh, as a last stitch motion preserving effort, uh, that might give her cord that room because I think that subluxation at C3-4 is critical. Scott Hodges pointed out very, very smartly thinking about vascular stretch. I mean, I have a very low threshold towards getting uh, either transcranial Dopplers or preferably a CTA. They're so good nowadays and you can see vessels to a high degree of definition. But I personally don't think that that's the case. With TCDs, you can get very nice uh, turning studies to look at vertebral artery flow. But again, that's a clinical decision. I don't see that necessarily. But I would contemplate a laminoplasty in this patient and I would probably go all the way up to C2 in her, which causes more neck pain. But since that goes all the way up to C2, I would really contemplate that. Thanks question we talked about this two days ago and and is it if you would have left part of the pll in this case would that have changed the overall outcome or is the superior in plate on the inferior aspect of three just two four changing the axis of rotation due to her facets um she looks like she's probably better in extension than i assume right than she is in flexion and, yes well and i don't know i I would have a hard time taking this implant out and putting more of a constrained implant in like a pro disc. Um, I wouldn't have picked this, but that's an option. But in this case, I probably wouldn't jump on what Jens recommended. I would have probably just fused the and got some more doses over those two segments because I think a two level ACDNF is still a great operation. Yeah. And I think the, you've got to consider the extent of her neuro neurologic picture. I mean, if this was just, you know, mild neurologic and neck pain, you know, you might opt for a more constrained prosthesis, but, you know, like Mike says, with her picture and, and, and that much, you know, neurologic deterioration, you know, I, I don't know that you need to push the envelope and, you know, I think you need to do something a little bit more cord decompressing. And with this and, rapidly progressive and, myelopathy, I think you want to do something where you can image the cord and follow yeah. the line. So if she gets progressively worse, you, you can uh, just see whether it's intrinsic, extrinsic, or or whatever. You don't want to block yourself out of a sick uh, a sick cord now. Yeah. And, and the other thing that I wouldn't do would be a fusion because she's already stenotic at two, three. She looks like she's probably stenotic down below her arthroplasty. So I like Jens's idea of doing the laminoplasty, 
at least you give her core room to breathe. And if you ever have to go back and do something from the front, you can do that at a later date, but at least you'll protect her cord and hopefully let her reverse all her uh, changes that she has. So, so do you think with the laminoplasty though, if her symptoms are really only when she's in cervical flexion, do you think that really decompresses uh, her cord and really buys her any, any improvement? Because, you know, the, the idea of a laminoplasty being that you allow for some cord drift posteriorly, but when she flexes, when she was standing upright, she actually felt fine. When she went into cervical flexion, that's when she developed symptoms. So I, I personally was concerned to do anything that allowed those segments, which I viewed to be hypermobile, to continue to move. Because yeah, I thought I, was developing yeah. anterior compression from this. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, and, and there's no wrong answer here, but my gut feel would just to be to just revise her to two-level ACDF and give her some stability, restore her lordosis, and whatever happens in the future above and below, then deal with it at some point. But well, because you said that. Because you said that, that's what I'm going to put up because it makes me feel better about myself. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's what I would have done. Yeah, so that that's actually what I what I ended up doing. I did talk to her about other options. Um, I performed a two level ACDF. And this is her on the table. Um, I felt like I got a pretty good improvement because I measured her preoperatively at about 70 degrees of kyphosis. Uh, um, then I got her to five degrees of lordosis, which is not as much as I wanted. Uh, however, you know, this is kind of trying to keep her, uh, facets from overstacking and causing problems like that. So post-operatively she came in like this. So our pre or our immediate interop there on the right and post-operatively when she stands up, it looks like she's now kyphosing below the level, uh, where I performed, uh, the fusion. So I don't know if I did the right thing. I will say clinically, she came in as a neuric one complete resolution of her symptoms, her neck pain. Once again, I, I told her this is not a neck pain surgery. Neck pain is gone, no ridiculous symptoms, but her myelopathic symptoms completely resolved. But I'm worried about her alignment. Okay. Hey Jacob, it, it, it's like we say all the time, you know, one operation may not do it. And, you know, just like they have progression of cardiac disease, you know, this is one of the deals. I mean, what you did was fine. You corrected okay. it. You, you did the right yeah. thing. I mean. And you may have a problem at, at two, three or level below. And just one of those things to deal with. And it may be that in the future, if she develops symptoms from above and below, you could do a more constrained prosthesis and preserve the motion above and below. Absolutely. And now looking at these images side to side, was there anything you would, I mean, I, I did not view any instability at that level, any kyphosis. And actually it looks, I, I don't know if, to me, it looks a little bit more kyphotic across that level. I don't know if it's postural. I don't know if the next couple of months as her posterior cervical uh, musculature gets stronger, if it'll improve. But I certainly think that maybe I didn't do something great. This is. Now, it, uh, it, I, I don't know that you could have done any better, any better, Jacob. I mean, yes, it looks like the spinous process has spread a little bit more post-op, but mm -hmm. you know, you used lordotic cages short of you know doing a real hyper lordotic cage. I don't know that you could have made much difference. Right. I mean, this is a, for me, a classic escape phenomenon plus deactivation. So she's obviously been through the Helena, but stenotic patients, whether it's their neck or their low back, tend to fall forwards. They get this extra millimeter or two of epidural perfusion that they really like. And I think this is not anything that you did wrong. This is her telling you. I'm still stenotic and it has nothing to do with your surgery because you did an absolutely gorgeous job. I'm wanting to have a little bit more room in my cord. So right. that's that's where I see this. And I see this very commonly. The only other option is that they have an acquired myopathy just from perioperative deconditioning and uh, maybe neck collars or God knows what. But this habitual thing, the final thing would be, and this is not applicable in her radiation or that her longest coli is contracted from two previous surgeries. Yeah, I actually thought she may have some coli contraction. It was a hard release to get those open. So yeah, so another, in other words, I'm going to watch her very closely. I think the laminoplasty may now be the next step if she redevelops myelopathic symptoms because I think she'll uh, improve. So I think my takeaways is a, is a young surgeon doing some of this. Uh, it's important to disclose those mistakes early. Hindsight's always 2020. I never willfully say that a surgeon hurt somebody. And I always tell the truth. So if something doesn't go perfectly, the first thing I did is I showed that patient that little bit of kyphosis she had. I said, you're doing great, but we're going to have to watch you. This reminds me of when, right before I deployed, <laughs> uh, 
I, I bottled some beer and it was three days before I deployed. I was sad because I wasn't going to be able to drink it. I ended up not being a problem because I put too much sugar in because I was uh, carbonated in the bottles. And my wife called me uh, when I finally got cell phone service and said a third of them had exploded in our garage. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and we're never perfect. So that's what I learned from that. I would like to thank everybody for giving both uh, Jake and I an opportunity to present this evening. And, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to do that, Jack. Thank you. Colorado yeah, boys, you did real good. Thank you. Yeah. Well great done, great gentlemen. Cases. Great cases. Great cases and great yeah. beer education, Mike. <laughs> Jacob and Mike, thank you. This was this was a great session.